Well, good morning, church family. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42, as we continue our walk through our summer sermon series on the life of Joseph. If you, if you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that Bible as a gift from us to you. You can keep that. You can mark it up so that you can have a copy of God's Word. All right, so we've been walking through Joseph's life, and it has been quite an adventure. All right, if you haven't been here, let me give you the super quick recap. Joseph, as a young teenager, was given dreams by the Lord about what was going to take place in the future. Uh, And he told his brothers those dreams. His brothers were already jealous of him because he he was the favored son of his father, Jacob, and they heard those dreams, and they threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. He would spend 13 years enslaved in chains in Egypt, not under his own free will. First he was at Potiphar's house, and then he was thrown into a dungeon for 13 years. As we walk through that, we ask deep questions of, why, God? How long, O Lord? Why does it have to be such deep? Long suffering. But God's plan was unfolding. And God would raise Joseph up in a way that only God would get credit to the number two in the whole land of Egypt because he interpreted a dream for Pharaoh that Egypt would have seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And that the famine was going to be so bad that you would forget the seven years of plenty. We walked with Joseph as he himself personally healed through giving uh, all of that hurt to God, through getting off uh, the judgment seat, and we saw Joseph's own growth. We have walked through areas of forgiveness about how the scripture commands us to love our enemies And if possible, the scripture commands us to reconcile, to take those next steps. That's what we've been walking through personally. So Joseph's brothers showed up after the famine began. And Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize him. In Joseph's quick thinking, he created a scenario. He accused them of being spies who have come to expose the nakedness of the land. We walked through that last week. He developed a plan where he decided that he would hold back one brother, Simeon, and uh, keep him in prison in jail, and he would send the rest of the brothers back because uh, 10 brothers showed up to buy grain, but... Uh, Joseph's father, Jacob, did not allow their youngest brother, Benjamin, to come with them. Benjamin was the only remaining son of Jacob's favorite wife, uh, Rachel. And so now Benjamin has assumed the position of favorite. And so Joseph sends the brothers back and says, look, prove to me you're not spies by bringing back Benjamin. Benjamin. All of you, come and present yourself to me, and then I will give you grain. All right? It's a masterful plan. Uh, All of it unfolding the dream that uh, was promised to Joseph way back in Genesis 37, but but was more than 25 years ago. That is that all the brothers would come and bow down. So Joseph actually returned the money to their sacks, and sent them on their way home. They are confused about that detail of the money being in their sacks. They don't know what to make of it, okay? Now, let's pick up our story in Genesis 42, beginning in verse 29. When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, the man, the Lord of the land, he spoke harshly with us, And took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, we are honest men. We are not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. 
One is no longer alive. And the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. But the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your household, but go. But bring your youngest brother to me that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. And then I will give your brother to you and you may trade in the land. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning as we've been walking through Joseph's life story, and it's impactful. It's full of the rich complexity of family and life, of forgiveness and dealing with deep hurts that we have when things are not as they ought to be. Father, this morning, I pray all across this room that people with deep scars, people with hurts from their family and wounds, Father, that they would realize that you can fill that void as the the father to the fatherless, that there is no God like you who has sent your son to draw near to us not only to save us from our sin, but you have drawn near to reach into the depths of our soul. And your spirit examines all of us and at the appointed times calls us forward to deal with our hurt and our confusion. And so, Father, I pray that you would continue to do that this morning as you have been all summer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No one likes to be the bearer of bad news. You know what makes it so much worse? That is when you know the person that you are going to give that bad news is going to react inappropriately. Fly off the handle. Blame you. The brothers are running through a hundred different ways to tell their father what has just taken place. Is there any way to soften the blow? Maybe we start with a joke and then just kind of ease it in. Maybe we do the Band-Aid approach, just rip it off, do it as quick as possible. Now this is one long journey back home for the brothers. How are they going to explain to dad now for a second time, that there is an issue with one of his sons. Notice the account that they give leaves out the most negative parts of the story. The fact that they were all imprisoned for three days and he was just gonna send one of them home, that would have been quite dramatic. They don't tell dad that portion. And they make no mention of the returned money. They've already found the returned money on their way home. You see, they know that dad is an eternal pessimist, always thinks the negative, lives by Murphy's law. If it's going to go wrong, or if it could go wrong, it will go wrong. Now, does this sound like anyone that you know? And the older we get, the more we have to fight the tendency of pessimism. You say, but wouldn't it be a good thing to have more money during a famine, right? Ah, dad's not going to see it that way. Let's just not say anything about it. Now they've told him, and they're bracing for his response. Verse 35, now it came about as they were emptying their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. Now that's not true. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are 
against me. Well, the money was found out, and Dad reacted the way we thought he would react. He wasn't praising God for provision in the midst of a famine. Nope. They are all dismayed. Somehow this too is a bad omen. Now, it's important to be fair to Jacob, okay? He's just gotten bad news about Simeon. If you put himself, if if we put ourselves in his shoes, right, we can understand. He doesn't know what we know about Joseph and about God's plan. But you see, that's the exact problem. Not that he doesn't already know God's plan, but that he never looks up. He's faced with a trial of life, and his immediate response is to be overly negative. As Chuck Swindoll puts it, he's negative. He has a resistant attitude and is only thinking on the horizontal viewpoint. Where does his faith in God come into play? All these things are against me. That's pretty hopeless and a defeated response. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to him must know that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah built the ark. By faith, Abraham went up from a land of his home to a land that he did not know. By faith, Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, expecting him to resurrect from the dead. (coughs) By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Where is the Jacob that wrestled with God? Where is the faith that says, the same God who rescued me from Esau? You see, he was faithful then, and he will be faithful now. Does this sound like someone who knows God and walks with God? Does someone, do you respond like Jacob and say, All these things are against me? Absolutely not. The man of faith is not marked by pessimism. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Christians are marked by optimism. You see, walking by faith is believing that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. That God is always working. Whether we can see it or not, God is always working for our good. The same God who gave his son for our sin to make me his own, that same God promises that every trial is for my good. One of our very dear saints was recently diagnosed with ALS. And this week I sat down with her. And you know what she said to me? That she had renamed the acronym ALS to mean my all loving savior. Because that's how she sees it. Every time she sees ALS, that's what she thinks. My all loving savior. Now, I'm certainly not saying that Jacob needs to to like what is happening to him. But where is his faith? So Reuben tries to talk to dad, offers his trust. Trust me, dad. I will even put my two sons to death if we don't bring Benjamin back to you. But Jacob has completely closed his ears and hardened his heart. He's only thinking about himself, and then he makes one of the coldest statements I've ever read in the Bible. Listen to verse 38. But Jacob said, 
My son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey that you are taking, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. But dad, your son Simeon is still alive. And we know where he is. <clears throat> Listen, this guy could have imprisoned us. He could have killed us on the spot. He accused us of being spies. But he didn't. We know where Simeon is. And if we take Benjamin, he will know that we are honest men. And then we will be able to have food. And, and everyone will come back. No. Joseph, his brother, is dead. And Benjamin is the only one left. (laughs) And if anything were to happen to him, I'd die. Now they must be absolutely cut to the core at this statement. Cut to the core. It's the hurt of the family. Dysfunction in the home that leaves lasting scars. As a youth pastor, I got to where I could... I could almost see family problems as youth walked in the door. You see, Jacob's sins deeply wound his children. And no family is perfect, right? No parents are perfect, children aren't perfect, but some are much worse than others. Some of you can uh, identify with the brothers. Am I not enough for you, Dad? Am I not enough? Am I not your son? All I ever wanted was your approval. James Dobson, years ago, uh, once wrote an article where he came across a sixth grade teacher in a middle class uh, California city. And the teacher gave an assignment to her students that said, finish this sentence. I wish, and then just finish the sentence. Now, she expected them to say, I wish I had more bicycles or a dog or a television set and maybe a trip to Hawaii. But instead, she was shocked because 20 of the 30 children made references to their own dysfunctional family. Here are a few of the actual sentences. I wish my parents wouldn't fight. And I wish my father would come back. I wish my mother didn't have a boyfriend. I wish I could get straight A's so my father would love me. I wish I had one mom and one dad so that the kids wouldn't make fun of me. You see, even as a middle-aged man, Jacob hasn't changed. Frankly, he's never going to meet the deep need in their life. Can I tell you something? He's destroyed all trust at this point. They don't have to keep blindly trusting them. Remember I gave you the example of one of my students and her father last week who, who continually broke promises. Listen, I'm sorry that it is not as it should be. But you need to allow God to meet that need. You need to allow God to meet that need. And here it comes now, the stone has been placed right there in front of the brothers. This stone could be a stone of stumbling. That is, they could sin out of the hurt of their father. They could revert back to the past just like they did with Joseph. You say, but that only led to guilt and shame. You see, sinning didn't solve the problem. And in fact, the problem never goes away. 
But for some reason, you see, this test keeps coming around and around and around again. Church family, I'm talking to you now. Is that stone going to be a stone of stumbling or a stepping stone? Where you pass the test and step up to the next level. The only way it becomes a stepping stone is if you allow God to heal you. If you allow God, God to fill the deep recesses of your soul that only he can. Dad is yet again choosing one son over the rest of them <coughs> from his favored wife. That's got to be a gut punch. But are they going to take that hurt and turn to God? Allow God to fill the void. Or are they going to, or will they cry out, Jesus, it is not as it should be. But you have promised in your word, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and here I come. Are they going to allow God to heal them the way that Joseph did? Or will they continue to cycle through bitterness and rage? Will this be a stone of stumbling or a stepping stone? I know all across this room, many of you have relationships that have repeatedly failed you. And God is talking to you right now because he won't fail you. He wants to heal you. So now back to Jacob. Jacob refuses to look to God. Instead, he's hardened his heart. He chooses to stick his head in the sand and ignore the problems. Conflict, avoidance. Hey, let's just hope it goes away. But Simeon's still in jail, okay? Let's say they might have six months. Maybe they stretch it out a year's worth of food. All the while, Simeon sits in jail. Chapter 43, verses 1 and 2. Now the famine was severe in the land. So it came about that when they had finished eating all the grain that they had, that they had brought back from Egypt, that their father said to them, well, go back, buy us a little food. Now, God pushes the story forward. Remember where we were last week. There's a theme here. <laughs> they didn't want to, but God pushed it forward. They are forced to deal with this situation because there's no food. So Jacob laughably simply says, hey, why don't you go back and buy us some more food? Now, there are two extremes whenever it comes to dealing with conflict. There is one type who is dominant. <clears throat> They're quick on their feet. They love to overwhelm, demanding immediate engagement. And then there's the complete opposite, total avoidance. They will not talk about the issues. They try to pretend everything's just back to normal. Never address what is needed. And both extremes are very toxic. Jacob is completely on the avoidance side. Simeon can sit, continues to sit in jail. And he's like, hey, why don't you go buy us some food? Judah's like, uh, dad, you know this. We've been through this. We can't go without Benjamin, okay? Pretending the situation is not what it is doesn't actually change anything. Verse 6, then Jacob said, why do you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? I mean, you read this, Jacob wants to make you scream. Jacob knows the situation. He knows that his sons did not cause this. And instead of him looking up to God and saying, God, what are you going to do here? Instead of him being the spiritual leader over his sons, instead of him being the calm, 
confident man who says, listen, God is with us. It will work out. No. He chooses to blame his sons. It's your fault. Always playing the victim. Does that sound like anyone you know? And here's the moment, though. Judah could blow his top. He could stumble over the stone like he did before. Let me give you a quick recap of Judah. Judah, according to chapter 7, verse 26, is the one who sold Joseph to Egypt. He's the one who sold him for money. And guess what? Judah's life has been an absolute disaster ever since. We get a sidebar of Judah in chapter 38. We realize Judah married foreign wives with foreign gods. We realize that Judah raised two sons who were so evil (coughs) that God struck them dead on the spot, okay? And then we won't even get into Judah and Tamar and all of that disaster. Those of you that know your Bible, though, are like, "But, but wait a second, then why does Judah get the blessing of Jacob? That the kingly line, that the Messiah is going to come from him if his life is such a mess. Because of this right here. You ready for this? Verses 8 and 9. Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. We will as well as you and our little ones. I myself will be the surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. Judah doesn't respond as a victim. He actually takes responsibility. No more blaming. No more sinning out of hurt. (coughs) He stops running, and accepts the consequences. In many ways, this is his heart repenting. It's a huge first step. This is actually the step that's going to lead to the saving of the family. They haven't been able to move forward until now. And Jacob concedes, finally lets Benjamin go. Now, here's where we'll pick up our story next time. But with our little time left, I want to make some direct application to you. I've been hinting at it all along. Some of you are like Jacob. You have a natural negative attitude about life. And you only view things horizontally. All change is negative. Anything new must be bad. And you try and cover yourself because your reply is, well, I'm realistic. Things do turn out bad. Jacob's problem is that he never looked to God. He never remembered God's promises. So what should you do? First, confess. Confess your overly negative attitude. Repent. That is the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Right? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Right? The opposite is being pessimistic. I understand if you only look horizontally... Are you a believer? Has God given his son for you? Has God given promises to you? Look up. So what can you do? Memorize Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, Paul wrote that when he was in prison. In prison for five years for preaching the gospel. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How can he say that? Because no matter your circumstances, you still have Jesus. 
you still have Jesus. You still have his presence and his comfort. What an opportunity for you to look different from the world. And you still have his promises, beloved. We must not be pessimistic. Unchristian. Now you think about that next time you're watching cable news. Because fear sells. Fear sells. We're called to rise above, to be different, to have a completely different perspective. Second, let's think about the brothers. You know, God used Joseph to orchestrate a test in his brothers' lives, right? A test that they had stumbled over time and time again. Friend, what is that stone in your life? It keeps coming around. You keep pretending like it's not there. We're blaming others. Or keep tripping over it over and over again. And you're never going to get to the promises of God. You're never going to get to the next season. You're never going to turn that into ministry like God wants you to unless you surrender it to him. Unless you cry out, all right, Jesus, you are my king. And I believe that in your strength, you can heal me. That you will give me the ability to step up, to step over and get on to bigger and better things that God has for you. Have you guys ever heard of uh, the legacy of Jonathan Edwards? So 150 years after Jonathan Edwards died, a, uh, an educator did a, a study of his genealogy and his life. And listen listen to the legacy that Jonathan Edwards left. One U.S. vice president, you say, all right, that's cool. One dean of law school, one dean of a medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, I don't know about that part, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. That's 150 years after Jonathan Edwards uh, his legacy. That's his family tree. Now, it, it happened to be about a similar time that a sociologist in 1877 did a study of a man named Max Jukes. And Max Jukes, uh, it, it turns out, the reason they found this guy is they found out that, that so many uh, criminals in prison could trace their lineage back to this one guy. So a sociologist unfolds the Max Jukes family tree, which uh, was about the exact same period as Jonathan Edwards. Now, in his family tree, (coughs) seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convicts, 310 paupers, 440 who were physically wrecked by the addiction of alcohol. Of the 1,200 descendants, 300 of them died prematurely. Now listen to me. It is 100% human nature to say that I've got family hurt, I've got crappy circumstances, and for you to continue the cycle and pass that stuff down. That's what you see with Max Jukes. That's 100% human nature. But beloved, you have a Savior who has come not just to save you from your sin on judgment day. Yes, that is paramount. 
I'm glad you gave your heart and your life to Christ when you were 10. Praise God for that. And you will be covered on judgment day. But that is not all Jesus came to do. The spirit of God resides inside of you. He came to give you abundant life and healing. And to look in every nook and cranny of your heart. He desires truth in your inmost being. And he can heal you. He can allow you to rise above. It's 100% human nature to pass that garbage on. But we have the Holy Spirit. And so I ask you in closing, because every one of us in this room have hurts, is the legacy of Jonathan Edward, is that going to start with you? Or are you just going to keep passing it on? like Max Jukes. Because if it's going to start with you, it's going to start right now today. Surrendering to the Holy Spirit of God, going, all right, I need help. King Jesus, I need you to heal this aspect of my life. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, you, you are good. You are good. You, you have sent your son to enter into our mess. You look right at it. You know it all. And you provide forgiveness and healing. You understand, King Jesus. You sympathize with our weaknesses. But just because you understand doesn't mean that you don't call us forward. I thank you for that. Because you love us, you provide healing and hope as we deal with that mess. Jesus, I pray all across this room that you would have your way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church family, the praise team is going to come lead us in one final song, and it is an opportunity for you to respond. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you, okay? This is, this is a praying morning, all right? If you want to use these steps as a way to pour out your heart before the Lord in praise or in petition, whatever the Spirit of God has pressed upon you, Would you have the courage to be obedient and to do business with him? Church family, would you stand?